Praise the Lord. So let's bow in prayer for that. Let's bow in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Father God, that we are able to meet you, Lord Father, in our places, in our homes, in our rooms, wherever we are, Lord. That place is a holy place because we are holy people, Lord Jesus. So, Lord, Father God, I pray that as we just come together as a body of Christ, we celebrate our second anniversary. You have been faithfully leading us, Lord Jesus. And, Lord, I pray that... Um, that we will continue, continue to just be, be restored and, and transformed by your word and by your presence and by your spirit, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your faithfulness, Lord Father God, to build Hana Church, Lord. Every member of our congregation, Lord Father God, is just a gift from you that we can come together and to be glorified in your name, Lord Jesus. So, Lord, I pray that as we come again, Lord, Father God, before you with prayer and supplication and may your word, Lord, Father God, that you have prepared for us today will transform our hearts, transform our lives to be representative of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, Father God. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit will empower us, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that you will hide me behind the cross, that only your word will be preached, that only your word will impact us, Lord Jesus. All for your glory, Lord Father God. We thank you in your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, um, <clears throat> And also another announcement, I'm sorry, and I just want to mention that, you know, we wanted to get together and start our service. But the thing is, we still need to wait because of the uh, because, because of the the uh, the church, uh, Mokotio Presbyterian Church that we are renting from. Now, they're still waiting for their uh, for them to open this uh, this this church up. So although we want to um, we want to meet. Uh, because our space is limited, we still need to kind of wait and see what our uh, what the Moto, um, Mokotio Presbyterian Church is willing to do. So we're still in the, in uh, in communication with them. So hopefully soon that we will able to meet. We can't have everybody come uh, at one time. We will have to make uh, some rotations or or, or sign ups. But anyways, um, also we might want to do some park. Uh, have a meeting outside and have a, a parking lot uh, service. But again, all these is still, we need to kind of be sensitive to our, uh, the church that we're renting this place from Mokdil Presbyterian Church. Uh, we also need to just honor them and respect their wishes also. Uh, but you know what? We are able to worship God right now, wherever you are, that place right now is where God's presence is at. So let's get into the word of God. Uh, let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. So please follow along as I read today's text. This is the word of the Lord. Be sober-minded, be watchful, seeking someone to devour, firm in your faith, knowing Amen. Now we're, we're we're getting toward the end, of Peter, and we don't want to rush it. We want to take our time because we need to glean everything that God has for us through these texts. It's just two verses, but there's so many, so many stuff, so many wonderful truth that is packed within these two verses. So we need it's it's important that we take our time. Now, last week we ended with a very encouraging promise from God. And that promise is that we can cast all our anxieties upon Jesus. Why? Because he cares for us. You know, we, we, if we can just end, end this, this, this letter, if Peter was able to just end this letter on that high note, saying to these suffering Christians to say, hey, all your anxieties cast to Jesus because he cares for you, period. Now, if we could end this, this letter on a high note, but Peter doesn't do that. Peter doesn't do that. Peter, in, in fact, says something that is, that is more uh, urgent in today's, today's text. 
So because if we end it with this last uh, last week's message of, of promise of God, that if we have any anxiety, all anxieties, we can cast upon Jesus and he'll, care, he'll take care of us. Well, that would make us feel like, well, you know what? Everything will be okay now. Everything is smooth sailing from now on, uh, but it doesn't end like that. Peter brings us down to earth again. And he says, there's something, there's things that is urgent. There is things that is most serious. Instead of relaxing because you can cast all your care to Jesus because he cares for you, we need to be sober-minded and be watchful. So Peter goes back again to the same, same concept as he has been repeating this concept of being sober-minded and be watchful. Sure, you have casted all your anxiety upon Jesus. Of course, Jesus take care of take care of us, and yet, and yet, nevertheless, we we have to stay awake. We have to be sober minded, and that's where we're gonna kind of um, look at today. You know, it's it, it reminds us of Paul's confession. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, it says that I have not already obtained this. And this means I have not already obtained in knowing Christ Jesus. Therefore, I will continue, continue to run. And that is similar to what Peter is saying. We can cast all our anxieties upon Jesus. Jesus takes care of us. But yes, we still need to pursue. We still need to stay awake, be sober-minded, and be watchful. See, knowing Jesus makes us be able to cast our anxieties upon Jesus. But keeping anxieties keeps us from knowing Jesus. So we need to stay awake. We need to be sober because we are still in the same race, the pursue of knowing Jesus, because there is an enemy that wants to hinder that journey that we have. We live in a fallen world. Ourselves, although we are saved still, we live in the flesh, which is, which is capable of sin. Therefore, therefore, be sober-minded and be watchful. Now, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, Peter, this is the word uh, Peter mentions about being sober-minded for the first time. It says, I'll read it in verse 13. Therefore, preparing your mind for action and being sober-minded for what? Set your hope fully on grace of Jesus. So we need to be sober-minded and set our hope, not on ourselves, not on other people, not on the world, not on the circumstances, but we set our hope on Jesus. That's why we need to be sober minded. And then in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7, Peter again mentions about being sober minded. He says, The end of all things is at hand, therefore, be self controlled and sober minded for the sake of your prayers. So we set our hope on Jesus, and also we have to be sober minded, stay alert for the sake of our prayers. And then today's text, today's text, be sober minded, be sober minded because the devil is attacking, searching, prowling, ready to devour you. Therefore, we need to stay awake. Now, uh, we need to kind of understand that when Peter is writing this, this letter to the persecuted church, he is reminded of his life. You know, he's, he's, he's showing, he's telling his life stories, life lessons. And of all the life lessons, I think the most important life lessons that we learn is especially when we fail. In our failure, when we overcome the failures, when we learn from our mistakes, that is a very precious, precious life lessons. And I think that is what Peter is trying to convey through this letter. He's saying that, you look, I made these mistakes. I didn't stay awake. I wasn't sober. So please, please do not make the same mistake I did, but stay sober minded, stay alert. And then that's, I think that's where Peter is coming from. 
that he's expressing his failures, and yet, and also at the same time, he is showing that restoration is possible. In chapter, in Mark chapter 8, we all know these stories. Peter says, uh, Jesus asked the disciples, Jesus says, hey, who do you think, what does the people think who I am? Who do you think that, 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 that I am? And, and they say, well, th that you are a prophet, that you're Elijah. And then Jesus turns to the disciples. Well, who do you think I am? And Peter, we all know this confession. Peter said, you are Christ. You are Christ. But when Jesus foretells his death and resurrection, it is Peter. It is Peter rebuking Jesus. His mind and understanding of Jesus as the Messiah were, was, was clouded, was, was blurred by his own selfishness. His own perception of the kingdom of God caused him to be, to have blurred vision, caused him to be not sober minded. He was not clear minded in seeing Jesus as the Messiah. And then in Matthew chapter 14, Jesus walks on water and Peter sees Jesus and he goes, if it's you, Lord, if it's you, Lord, command me to come. So Peter gets out of the boat and he's walking on water. Now, we don't know how many steps he took. Imagine, imagine the scene where Peter is walking on water to Jesus. Was he so reminded then? I think so. Was he alert? Was he watchful? I think so. I think he was focused upon Jesus. And yet what happened? He saw the wind and then he was afraid. And he began to sink. And Jesus said, oh, you little faith. Why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? See, if we are not sober minded, if we are not alert, faith dissipates. If we don't focus upon Jesus, what happens? The attack of the enemy comes into our hearts. And then in Luke 22, see, I'm just kind of mentioning the failures of, of, of Peter. The time when Peter wasn't sober minded. The time when Peter wasn't watchful. And in Luke 22, we also know that when Jesus said that, when Jesus talked about uh, being, 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 uh, dying on the cross, Jesus said, uh, Peter said, I, I will never leave you. I will go to prison and to death for you. And what happens later on? Peter denies Jesus three times. And then there's a scene in uh, Luke 22, verse 61. It says, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter and Peter. At that time, remember the saying of the Lord, how Jesus said before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. So Jesus remembered, so Peter remembered what Jesus said. But he also remembered something else, I believe. In Luke chapter 22, verse 31, 32. This is the same night where Jesus was, was, uh, was, uh, was persecuted. Um, Luke 22, verse 31, 32. Jesus says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Now, this is a very significant, significant word that Jesus has said here. Because it ties into what Peter is mentioning in today's text. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan have demanded to have you. What does that mean? Does Satan have rights to demand? Yes, he does. He does because of the fallen world. So Satan wanted to completely crush and defeat Peter. That's what's going on in the spiritual world. 
We don't see it, but in the spiritual realm, the enemy, Satan, is prowling like a lion, ready to devour each and every one of us. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demands to have you that he might sift you like wheat. Now, it's interesting in verse 31, the word you, it's not a singular word, it is plural. So in verse 31, it, it says the Satan is not demanded to just have Peter. Satan is demanded to have everyone, the whole disciples. Satan desires that in the sifting process, no wheat shall remain. But that all, like Judas ultimately, will be blown away like chaffed. See, that's what Satan is doing. Satan wants to sift us, wants to accuse us, saying that, yeah, he is no, he is not wheat, he is a chaff. Satan demanded to have you. Now, Peter is reminded, re remembering these words. Now, we know this story in Job chapter 1. Chapter 1, the Lord, uh, verse 7 and 8, I'll just read. The Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? So God is speaking to Satan. And Satan says, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. So here's a courtroom scene. God is the judge and Satan is the, is the accuser. What does Satan do? What does Satan say? That he's been going to and fro on the earth, from walking up and down on it. For what? Well, to devour, to put people in the ch through the chaff. And that's why, that's why God is saying, now in verse 8, verse 8, and, and the Lord God said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Now, this was a, a rhetorical question. The answer is obviously yes. Because Satan considers everyone. Satan targets everyone. Satan targeted Job. Satan targeted the disciples. Peter and Satan well, this is targeting you and I. Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro, into your homes, into our church, everywhere, from walking up and down on it like a roaring lion, ready to devour us. Therefore, that's why in verse 8, be sober-minded and be watchful. See, Satan has the right to demand, to demand, because of the court of law. Say, sin entered and gave authority over to Satan as the ruler of this world. So that's why Satan was able to demand Peter. Satan was able to demand Job and Satan is able to demand you and I. Peter is remembering Jesus' word. Peter is remembering Jesus when Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Satan demanded to have you. So, Jesus, so Peter is telling these persecuted church, Satan has demanded you. Be sober minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So our defense be watchful, like a watchman keeping an eye on the enemy. What is the opposite of being watchful? Well, I think the opposite of being watchful is sleeping. And also, Peter is reminding, the reason why he says be sober-minded and be watchful, be watchful triggers something in Peter's mind. Another time that he failed to stay awake. Jesus asked John and James and Peter to come and help him to pray because Jesus is about to face the cross. In Mark chapter 14, 
Mark chapter 14, verse 33, it says, And he took with him Peter, James, and John, and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. This is the Son of God. This is Jesus. He's greatly distressed and troubled. And he asked, and he takes Peter, James, and John to help him. And in verse 34, Jesus said, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. Be watchful. Well, Peter, James, and John was not watchful. They fell asleep. And in verse 37 of Mark 14, And he came, and Jesus came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Simon, are you asleep? Today I titled our text, our message, Simon, are you asleep? And you know, instead of Simon, you can add, we can add our own names. Sang, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray. Peter is reminded of Jesus' word when Jesus said, watch and pray. That you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Peter is reminded of Jesus' words when Jesus said, watch and pray, so that when the enemy comes, when the lion comes, that he will not devour you. So Peter is vividly remembering the time in his life of failures. That's why when we read this text, we need to hear Peter's heart. His compassionate heart for us to be watchful, for us to, to stay awake and be sober. Simon, are you asleep? Is echoing in his heart and it needs to echo in ours. Be sober minded. Be sober minded in keeping your faith. Be watchful and pray to not enter into temptation because the enemy is continuously attacking. In verse 9, in verse 9, today's text, it says, Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of suffering are being experienced by your, brother, by your brotherhood throughout the world. Resist him, he says. See, resist means something is pushing against you. If nothing is pushing against you, we don't need to resist. We need to resist Satan because he will not leave you alone. We need to keep resisting until we face Jesus face to face. Paul's final word to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13, echoes the same urgency of staying awake. Paul says, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. So we need to be that. We need to, as individual, as God's people, we need to stand firm. As church, we need to stand firm. I read an article how, how um, if you're faced with a lion, um, if you ever go to safari, and when you find yourself face to a lion, how do we resist the lion? Well, it says this. Number one is stand firm. Stand your ground. Don't panic. Number two, do not run. Do not play dead. Look straight and keep your eye contact. Number three, appear bigger by waving your hands, your arms, and, and yell. And then the last thing, if you have to fight, aim for the face or the eye. Now, I pray that you will never face a lion, a live lion, but we will, you will face the attack of Satan. So how do we resist him? Well, we resist him by standing firm in our faith in Jesus Christ. Martin Luther said this. He says, why should you fear? Why should you be afraid? Do you not know that the prince of this world have been judged? He's no Lord. He's no prince. He's no king no more. 
We, you, have a different, different, a stronger Lord, Christ Jesus, who have overcome and bounded him. So, do not fear. How do we resist the devil? Number two is that we do not run or play dead. We do not ignore because Satan is actively, will continue to be involved in your life. So what do we do? We stay awake. We keep an eye. We keep an eye contact. We see what the strategies of the enemy is. So we could be wise. How can we resist the devil? Well, we resist by trusting in the one who is bigger. We don't have to act like we're big. We are big because the one in us is greater than the one in the world. Trust in the one who is more powerful. James 4 verse 7 says, Submit yourself therefore to God and then resist the devil and he will flee from you. By submitting ourselves before God, we invite God's power in us, in our lives. So we don't have to appear bigger. Our faith in God is big. And then the last, in, verse, in, the, in the fourth thing, how can we resist the devil? Well, we aim with the word of God as the whip, weapon of victory. Jesus, when he was tempted in the, de in, in the desert, he defended, he rebuked the enemy with the word of God. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written. So we resist Satan by standing firm in our faith. We resist by not ignoring, but understanding and, 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 and keeping an eye. We resist by trusting in the one who is bigger. And we resist by attacking with the word of God. The last point that I want to make, we want to go back to Luke 22, verse 31, 32. So Peter is reminded of what Jesus said. When Jesus said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. We need to stay away because that same strategy of the enemy is happening in our lives. He wants to accuse us. He wants to destroy us. How can we resist the devil? Well, the answer is in verse 32. Jesus said, but I have prayed for you. I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brother. When, what Jesus is saying is that when you have turned again, what that means is that when, when you have been restored. Because what, when, what Jesus said here, this was before Jesus, uh, P Peter denied Jesus three times. Jesus knew what was going to happen. Therefore, because Jesus knew that, the, that Satan wanted Peter, to sift him, to destroy him, Peter, to, 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 to destroy Peter, Jesus prayed for Peter. That your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, you will turn again. You will be restored again. Strengthen your brothers. So how can we resist the devil? We resist the devil by standing firm in Jesus. We resist the devil by keeping an eye on him and be wise. When we resist the devil by trusting in the one who is greater, that we have confidence. And that we trust and that we resist the devil by the word of God. And also here, the last point is that we resist the devil because we know that Jesus is praying for us. Satan was success, uh, successful in, in making Peter stumble. But he didn't fail. Satan was successful in making Peter's faith stumble, but not completely fail. Why? Because Jesus prayed for Peter. We can resist the devil because Jesus will pray for you too. 
He is interceding for us. Not only can we cast all our anxieties upon Jesus and he will care for us, we know that we can overcome the enemy because Jesus prays for us. John chapter, 15, uh, John chapter 17, verse 15, it says, Jesus is saying, Jesus is praying to the Father. He says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. You keep them from the evil one. We will also stumble, but we will not fall. Jesus will not let us fall. Jesus is faithful. And the last thing in the spiritual battle, the last point is here, is when Jesus said to Peter, and when you have turned again, when you have been restored, when you have repented, and I, when, when I've called you, there's a job to do. And that job is strengthen your brothers. That is so important for us. See, spiritual warfare is not about individual battle. It is, and yet it is not, because we are a body of one. When you have turned again, when you have stumbled, we get back, we trust God more, we desire to be uh, used by God, and that desire has to be the desire to strengthen your brothers. And that's why in verse 9 of today's text, Peter said, Resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. We are all in the same situation. Peter ends his word with the importance of the body of Christ. We are in the same attack of the enemy. No one is exempt from the wrath, accusation, and enmity of Satan. Therefore, we need, we need to stay together. We need to strengthen one another because they are also suffering. We have a common, a common enemy. Therefore, we need to be sober-minded and be watchful to the strategies of Satan. We need to stay awake and see what, is, what, what, what the enemy is doing. Be watchful, but you have to be watchful of yourself first. We need to be sober-minded, be watchful, what enemy is doing, but we need to see first ourselves first. We don't look at other people and say, oh, the enemy is doing this, the enemy is doing that to that person, that person. We have to look inward and to see what the enemy is doing to me, through me. Instead of looking at the plank, uh, instead of looking at the, the speck in others, we have to look at the speck, uh, the plank in our own eyes. So, dear church, the enemy has your number, the enemy has my number, and we need to stick together. We need to stand firm, be sober minded, be alert, be watchful for one another. And we can resist because Jesus overcame. And when we trust in, in Jesus with our faith, we can resist the enemy. We can resist the enemy by keeping an eye on him all times. And we can resist by keep resisting by the attack because he will not relax. So we also have to be urgent. We have to be alert. And also we resist we don't have to make ourselves appear big. You just need to humble ourselves and, and allow Jesus to be manifest in us because he is greater than the one in the world. And we resist by the word of God, by the word of God as a weapon. And we resist knowing that Jesus is praying for you right now. So be encouraged, church. And let's strengthen one another. Let's strengthen one another. I pray that our church, Hana Church, is a church that is strengthened by unity, by loving one another. Let's bow and pray. Lord Jesus, we thank
the fellowship and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit be upon all of us from now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Well, thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, it's, we're, we're celebrating our second year. Um, hopefully we will do some, uh, some gathering or something. Uh, last, uh, last week's um, car wash, uh, a lot of people showed up. So it was so nice to see a lot of you. So uh, have a wonderful week and God bless. Thank you.